Hello, classroom. How are you? This is Dr. Annette Fairrich. I'm a teacher. You are here in the bookless classroom, and we are moving along with our Hurry Freedom book. Hurry Freedom is also, um, you'll also not only get the story, you will also get my interjections. My some subjective and some objective opinions. All right, um, so I, I, no pictures here, so I'm gonna just read, okay? Hurry Freedom by Jerry Stanley. If I didn't say that, African Americans in Gold Rush, California. Gibbs said that when he first saw slaves at the age of 12, his soul was stamped with the hatred of slavery. So it probably wasn't an accident that he formed a partnership with a man whose hatred of slavery exceeded his own. Peter Lester had seen slaves whipped to the point of death and his own back was scarred from whipping. He had seen toenails pulled out with pliers to prevent slaves from running away and he had seen escaped slaves set on fire as a warning to others not to run. I realize I put the um, bookmark there, but I realized that I already read that. I don't know. I'm sorry. I'm going to have to, I was going to try because I, I, I don't know if I'm going to end up reading more pages except for boxes and occasional stray dog. The alley behind the boot emporium was usually deserted at night. Gibbs drove to the back door to the store. No, we're going to just go ahead and if it's, if I'm rereading, I'm going to, I'm rereading. Sorry. It isn't, and this is reread. It isn't known how Lester became free, but when he came to California with his wife and daughter in 1850, he was chilled to find that slavery existed in a free state. The reminder of servitude, the marks on his back, and his craving to escape from the past made him a perfect match for Gibbs, the protege of Frederick Douglass. Together, they conspired to make a few changes in California. During business hours, the owners of the Boot Emporium extended every courtesy to their customers who tolerated slavery in the state. But after hours, Gibbs and Lester ran a school for leaving slavery. Slavery wasn't as rigid in California as it was in the South. I think I, I think I just finished on the next page. I just wanted to make sure I wasn't rereading two or three pages. I'm so sorry. I should have done this, but I, I thought I knew exactly where I was, and I did it because I started talking at the end of the last class. In his strong speaking voice, Gibbs told the guest about Frederick Douglass and the Underground Railroad. Lester talked about the rights of every human being and cited himself as an example of what they could become. Slavery was illegal in California, he told them, and the state didn't have a law requiring the capture of runaways. If they ran, they could be free and they could make it on their own, as ex-slaves were doing every day. With Lester's wife at the piano, the partners ended each evening by teaching their pupils anti-slavery songs. No one knows how many ran afterwards, but according to Lester, when they left, we had them strong in the spirit of freedom. They were leaving slavery every day. Others joined Gibbs and Lester in the struggle against slavery in California. They created a California version of the Underground Railroad, which operated out of the Boot Emporium and other Black-owned businesses. While no one was looking, or more accurately, while most were looking for gold, the network of shop owners, barbers, and tailors hid slaves until arrangements could be made to stow them on a steamer bound for Panama or Mexico. What a shame, right? What a shame. What a shame that you have to leave the United States of America for freedom. And, by the way, go to Panama or Mexico. What? What a shame. What a, you know, what a, what a mark on our democracy. Part of, Gib, 
Part of Gibbs' role in the railroad consisted of driving a buckboard and looking as innocent as possible. Wearing the clothes of a common laborer, he made trips from San Francisco to Sacramento, where he picked up fugitives brought there by the railroad. They came from the gold towns to the north and from the mining regions, and during return trips to San Francisco, Gibbs hid them under a tarpaulin when there were... When, when there was traffic on the wagon trail, he rode in downpours of rain and blistering heat and in golden days when a breeze ruffled his floppy hat and the wagon seemed to move on its own. It was good work and the boot emporium wasn't neglected. Lester's wife and daughter helped out as clerks when one of the partners was away on railroad business. Trotting along in trips that took an average of two days each, Gibbs watched for men on horseback hired by owners whose slaves had disappeared. When the pos posses, I'd imagine, approached, Gibbs steered the wagon off the road in deference to them. He was always watching for posses because he knew what could happen if he was caught. A national law passed in 1850 specified six months in jail and a fine of $1,000 for helping a slave who entered California as a fugitive. There was, no, there was no plenty for helping a slave escape. There was no penalty. There was no penalty for helping a slave escape in California, but in reality, being caught could result in a charge of kidnapping and jail time, which could be worse than death. Gibbs was well aware of the fact that state prison director James Estelle sometimes sent African-American prisoners to New Orleans, where they were sold into slavery. Except for boxes and the occasional stray dog, the alley behind the boot emporium was usually deserted at night. Gibbs drove to the back door of the store and led his passengers into a storage room with tables, beds, and an oil lamp. The occupants knew Gibbs by the time they arrived, but it didn't change their uneasiness. Seeing the partners the next morning in fine suits and shoes that sparkled perhaps gave the fugitives some hope that Gibbs and Lester knew what they were doing. In the quiet of the storage room, the slaves could hear muffled voices in the store and the sound of the commerce that made their freedom possible. Ring, ring, ring. They might stay for two days until a bribe had been paid to an employee of a ship bound for South America. Old shoes left by customers were available to them, and they were given a few days' food so they could remain hidden until the ship was well out to sea. They left through the back door as quietly as they had arrived and always at night. Gibbs was back in laborer's clothes when he twitched the reins against the horse and rode into the darkness. The cast of characters that made the railroad work included people from all walks of life. An African-American woman named Mary Ellen Pleasant came to San Francisco from Boston in 1849 with $80,000 from her husband. She opened a boarding house, started a loan business, and speculated in real estate, increasing her wealth to more than $130,000. She gave money to the railroad and to fugitives, dined with Gibbs and Lester, and many have helped them secure slaves, and may have helped them secure slaves as dinner guests. Reverend Barney Fletcher had sold newspapers until he earned enough money to buy his wife and children out of slavery. Therefore, he started the African-American Methodist Church in Sacramento, where he preached and hid runaways in the basement. A black man known only as Elijah falsified his papers for fugitives who planned to stay in California, and Jeremiah Sanders led armed raids on mining camps to liberate slaves. Town criers such as Aaron Cobb in Marysville walked down the street shouting news and giving misinformation about fugitive slaves. He was seen heading west in Mariposa County. Cobb might say to send posses in the wrong way. Cobb might say to send posses in the wrong direction. Gibbs friends also included white abolitionists who had a habit of reading California newspapers every day. Although slavery was illegal in the state, the papers carried ads announcing the selling of slaves. For example, the Sacramento Transcript advertised a valuable Negro girl age 12, offered for servitude. Said girl is of amiable disposition, a good washer, ironer, and cook. If abolitionists could get to 
the sale in time, they tried to outbid the, the competition. When Charlie Bates was offered for sale in 1851, abolitionists paid $750 for him and set him free. In 1853, Caleb Fay, a white lawyer, paid $1,000 for a boy from Alabama. He became a boot black with the aim of buying his mother and sister out of slavery. About 100 slaves were purchased by the white abolitionists and most stayed in California. The white abolitionists were a small minority of the population, and they paid a price for their actions. Sacramento attorney Cornelius Cole suffered losses in his merchandising business and threats of violence after he denounced slavery. Fay's merchandising business lost clients because of his anti-slavery views. Abolitionists were sometimes physically attacked and discouraged from attending social gatherings. The support for slavery was complicated in California as, else, as elsewhere. Abolitionists aside, whites didn't like slavery because it meant they had to compete with slaves for jobs, but they didn't like free African Americans either. The great dilemma for most white Americans was what would become of the country's four million slaves if slavery was abolished? Where would they go? To New York, Ohio, California? Slavery was tolerated in California because it was more acceptable than the alternative, a large black population that would compete for jobs and perhaps show the blacks were inferior. And that was what Reconstruction was all about, which we're going to get to after the Civil War. Reconstruction after the Civil War was all about the large black population that would compete for jobs and perhaps show that blacks weren't inferior. That's it. That's it, the thesis of all of this. Yet there were whites in the state who weren't trapped by race prejudice, so African Americans had some allies. They were often in need of them. Shortly after the Boot Emporium opened, tax collectors presented a tax bill to Gibbs and his partner. The tax was required of an individual before he could vote, but since blacks couldn't vote, Gibbs and Lester saw no reason for paying. As a result, their goods were put up for auction. The hip boots and blue shoes were stacked on the sidewalk in front of the store, and more than 50 people gathered for the auction, most of them white. At the start of the sale, one of Gibbs' white friends moved through the crowd, telling people the situation and urging them not to bid. And indeed, there were no bidders. Even as the stunned taxman lowered prices to ridiculous levels, Gibbs, Lester, and some in the crowd moved the shoes back in the store, and the boot emporium continued. The tax collectors never returned. Gold Rush, California had the capacity for fairness when people of different races knew each other by name. What a beautiful sentence. Another, this, this, oh, you have just written something, Jerry Stanley, and you just have such beautiful language. Gold Rush, California had the capacity for fairness when people of different races knew each other by name. And that actually is part of psychological theory as well, although it was done completed much of it under um, a lot of unethical conditions, so it's hard to really um, draw the, the accurate conclusions. But, you know, luckily, some people like me will let them get away with it only because... No, I'm not letting them get away with it. I never mind. Abolitionist Cornelius Cole. All I'm saying is, is that I, as a scientist, I understand the desire for results. I don't understand the desire for, um, you know, violating human dignity and integrity every hour of every day. That I don't believe in. Chapter 5, A Modest Request. Three months after the Boot Emporium opened, the business suffered a crime that sent fear through the African-American community. One day in November 1851, a white man entered the store and said he wanted to buy a certain pair of boots if Lester would set them aside for a while. After he left, a second man entered and tried to buy the same boots. The partners explained the situation. The man became angry and two 
end the arguing, he was allowed to buy the boots. Minutes later, both men entered the store together. Acting upset at the loss of the boots, the first man screamed racial names at Lester. Gibbs joined his partner behind the counter, but was pushed aside as the first man drew a club he had hidden and beat Lester to the floor. He kept clubbing Lester while the other man held a gun to, in his hand and watched for Gibbs to move. Lester was unconscious and in a pool of blood when the two men left laughing. The owners had been set up and the attackers left laughing because they knew they couldn't be prosecuted for a crime. African Americans couldn't testify in court against whites under any circumstances. So we see how... I, what, did I read that? We see how the rules are different. The laws are different for one group of people and another group of people. And that is what happens when we don't have a democracy. Rules are made for everybody. They are not made just simply for the party in place. They're made for all Americans and they're supposed to be made with all Americans in mind. That is for the best of all Americans, with all Americans in mind, for, for the people, of the people, by the people. In April 1856, months before California even became a state, the legislature had passed an act concerning crimes and punishments which prohibited blacks and other non-whites from testifying in cases involving whites. Other states and territories had the same restriction, and the effect was to deny blacks the protection of the law. The law meant that Lester could have been murdered by his attacker and the crime could not have been prosecuted because the only witnesses were black. Crimes by whites against blacks, where there were white witnesses, couldn't be prosecuted either if whites refused to testify, and they could not be made to testify. For black 49ers, the miracle of the gold rush was a job and advancement. The nightmare was little protection under the law. To be fair, California was a violent place for everyone in the 1850s, regardless of its law. It had a population numbering in the thousands before it had a stable government, a legal system, churches, schools, or other institutions to help bring order. That is really typical when you think about it of the West. You just need to think about it. If they are settling the West, they are coming there before others to regulate make laws about what is going on. The 49ers didn't know each other and were fierce in competing for gold, jumping each other's claims and shooting each other as well as Native Americans, African Americans, Hispanics, and Asians. The 49ers had no attachment to California or to each other, and most planned to return home after striking it rich. Those who did not strike it rich frequently resorted to assault, robbery, and murder. Crime was so bad in California that in 1851 and again in 1856, armed men formed uh, vigilance communities and took the law into their own hands, vigilantes, and hanged suspected criminals without a trial. Between 1850 and 1853, I wonder what color most of those people were. Between 1850 and 1853, San Francisco had 1,200 murders, an astonishing number for the size of its population. Although frequently overlooked in, pop, in popular accounts of the gold rush, violence was common throughout the 1850s. Easily identifiable African Americans were natural targets when caught alone, as Gibbs and Lester had been. No matter the town, the newspapers carried the same stories. A New York Negro was robbed and murdered for the $300 he was carrying. The Negroes known as, as Calaveras Bat Bill. That's what I would guess. The Negro known as Calaveras Bill was murdered at Poverty Bar. Augustus Negrito was beaten and kicked in the head by George Vincent, who stole Negrito's money. And a white man broke into the home of a young black woman and in her presence took her money, shoes, cooking pots, and canned goods. Although news items 
none of these crimes were punishable in court. So publishing them in the newspaper, but that's all that they could do. Even with a gash on the back of his neck and numerous cuts and bruises, Lester recovered. After three months, after three months, he called his beating the vicious act of a society that claimed to be civilized. The same thing. The same thing is going on. We have vicious attacks on people from a society that is claiming to be civilized. He called his... Uh, Gibbs called it the work of savages. Yeah, and the irony in that, right? And the irony of calling black people savages and, and the animal behavior that these racist individuals across the board. If you're a racist, you will act like an animal. It must be in your DNA. Must be that's the problem with atheists. They really are from the animal kingdom. I don't know. Maybe you really do know the secret to your existence. You did evolve from an animal. I didn't. I didn't. I don't act like a savage. In fact, I've always taught against it. Spent all my time. Don't know how I would have time for savagery behavior. Well, if you only have six months of training and mental health, Maybe that's all you need to prove your case. The work of savages, and it was a scene he wouldn't easily forget. In some ways, it had been as hard on Gibbs because he had heard Lester's screams, seen his blood splatter, and witnessed the men laughing as they left, and he could do nothing. By the time Lester returned to work, the store had a shotgun under the counter to balance out the law. You know, it just is coming to my mind that, you know, um, but by the grace of God go I. Right? But by the grace of God go I. That we have these um, forefathers that laid the groundwork so that today we won't have to suffer the same kinds of injustices. That's the groundwork that our forefathers were, were setting. And what we have here is we have a bunch of um, what's the word I'm looking for? It's actors, but that's not the word I'm looking for, right? Replacements, that's not the word I'm looking for. Immigrants, that's not the word I'm looking for either because I'm not talking about your typical immigrants. I'm talking about your blue-eyed, blonde-haired immigrants. You're racist. You're fascist is what I'm talking about. But by the grace of God, go I. But for the grace of God, go I. Are we returning back to this, this kind of animalistic behavior and finger pointing as animal behavior? Absolutely. We, we've never left it. And for exactly the same reasons, right? But maybe that's what I'm going to talk about. Is it resources for our, um, I got to write that down, for our philosophical classroom? Is it resources? We're going to talk about that in our philosophical classroom. Is it resources that cause racism? And actually not racism, but really more discrimination. We're going to talk about some of the differences. So I know that there are a lot of people who object to what I'm saying here and, and the um, angle that I'm taking on this, right? The perspective that I take on this, there's a lot of people, but there's a lot of people who don't really care anything at all about the truth. And, and 
um, almost as many people who claim to care about it. So, can't have a conjunction. Both cannot be more true to, than one. <laughs> Look it up! At the time of the assault, the partners knew about the law bearing, barring black testimony. Like African Americans in the gold towns, Gibbs and Lester tried to avoid situations where they might be victimized. The stones occasionally thrown at Gibbs' buckboard weren't any more alarming than a threat by a drunk who could barely stand up. But Lester's beating in their store in their neighborhood by thugs who didn't want any money but were mainly out to have fun, brought a chill to the city's black population. There were, their very existence in California was brought into question. You know, this just is just resonating with me so much. Gold rush, gold rush justice. Two men are hanged by San Francisco vigilance committee in 1851 right so vigilantes the vigilantes they got their name from apparently this vigilance committee so there's the history of and and vigilance right so if you're vigilant you are tenacious you go after it that's what you are right vigilante i'm gonna get you and and I'm not going to stop right for justice so vigilance I will pursue pursue you for justice now when I give you those definitions they obviously are not a dictionary definition so you can look up to see if it's more specific than what I'm giving you I'm giving you a real a, 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 a good idea but also note that you might get one definition but note the variations in the definitions, not to prove me right, right? But, but what I always get at are the subtleties. Why can't you always use one word to replace another one? Because there are subtle differences in this word. So vigilance is, in this capacity, has an aspect of flavor and air of justice about it that I will pursue for the purpose of justice. What, but vigilantes, it's for the purpose of what I see is just, right? Clearly, it's my perspective. So see how we get all of these connotations put on a single word. They'll pick out vigilance, which means to, you know, pursue, but, but our connotation has more to do with vigilante, right? Justice by my own means, basically. Um, <clears throat> but this part about Lester's beating in their store, in their neighborhood, by thugs who didn't want any money, that's what's going on now. That is what's going on now with these right-wing injustices that are going on, these right-wing fascists that are taking justice into their own hands, defining it in whatever way they want to define justice in order to basically to put money in their pocket. But here again, they are not pursuing money, but mainly they have fun, brought it, mainly they have fun. And to see them do that what did he say? Because he had heard Lester's screams, seen his blood splatter, and witnessed the men laughing as they left. And they could do nothing. There is nothing that enrages a person more. I had a dream the other night because I have a lot of people who are, who are, committing criminal acts all around me. And, and even if they are doing it in the name of ignorance, that is in my, from my definition of purposeful ignorance, because I have been saying this stuff for a very long time. So if people don't know, it is simply just purposeful ignorance. And I had a dream that 
Lucy was sick, really sick. Because I know people are trying to make Lucy sick and to do something with both me and Lucy and and then disparage me as well. So this is this has been, you know, I've been saying this for a very long time. And um, so I had a dream that Lucy was really sick and you could see how sick she was because I went to go pick her up and 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 somebody, you know, somebody gave her something and she was fine, but somebody gave her something and then tried to blame it on me. So this is why I had the dream, right? So it does have to do with this. So she was really sick and I was telling a police officer in my dream that she was really sick and I was picking her up and I was showing him how sick she was and she was so sick that she was, you know, so in the dream it was very real. And I picked her up and she was sweating and she was thin and she was shaking. And that's what's going to happen if mama's not taking care of her. I'm just letting you know. Absolutely no doubt. Uh, you think you're going to take care of her. No, you're not. No, you're not. Because they won't let you. They won't let that dog go. So I went to pick her up. And the officer started laughing in the same way, thinking it was funny. I was showing him how sick she was. And she was so looked so sick, and he he was laughing at me. And in the dream, I swatted the officer like that, like, and then I was arrested in the dream. That was the dream. I swatted him, and then I was arrested in the dream because, of course, that was assault to the officer, right? How Gibbs was able, Mifflin Gibbs was able to hold it together while a person that he loved and cared for and admired and respected was being beaten almost to death in the same way that George Floyd was, right? Where they stood there and they had all that they could do. Thank goodness they could take out their cameras. Thank goodness they were able to take out their cameras, right? They were able to report it in the newspapers but that was all they were able to do. To throw a rock through every window that said no Negroes allowed and to a, no, 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 no. That's not what I wanted to read. The same stories. A New York Negro was robbed and murdered for the $300 he was carrying. The Negro known as Calaveras Bill was murdered at Poverty Bar. Augustus Negretto was beaten and kicked in the head by George Vincent, who stole Negretto's money. And a white man broke into the home of a young black woman and in her presence took her money, shoes, cooking pots, and canned goods. Although news items, none of these crimes were punishable in court. Although caught on video, most of these crimes were barely, where is that guy? Tell me where that police officer is that was on George Floyd's neck. I want to know exactly where he is. Exactly. Exactly. And is somebody making sure he's staying there? I doubt it. I doubt it. That dude did somebody a big favor. No way. No way is this system punishing that man check it out not the way things are going now not a single bit not the way things are going at all you want somebody uh, some some raunchy cowboy to run around here and say he's president he's the emperor he's got no fucking clothes sorry bookless classroom You know, to use curse words like that in the presence of people who use them, you know, every day as if they were an article in a sentence is absolutely um, appropriate, is absolutely appropriate when you read this kind of history. 
it's absolutely appropriate to cuss like a sailor when you read this kind and want to lash out and want to lash out how Gibbs held it together even as a woman who is you know never been prone to violence I'm just thinking about the history of these people. I'm just thinking about the history of these people to just 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 know that you can get away with things and then be able to predicate it with the statement uh, morality is in the toilet anyway. So why not do it? What brings a white man who's likely a Christian, who likely goes to church, who likely has a place in the community, what makes him do that? They were afraid about jobs for sure but they were more afraid that they would lose a job to a more qualified black man and what would that say about them that was the real fear how could they live in a place where their wealth and lives could be taken away any day one answer was being careful and being willing to live with fear another answer was that they couldn't go on unless they took some action to protect themselves african americans in the gold towns kept a low profile and went on with their lives following lester's beating african americans in san francisco decided to do something the only question was what while Lester was recovering, Gibbs joined members of the neighborhood at a meeting at William Hall's billiard parlor. Most were business owners and workers in the Underground Railroad, and they were educated, many self-taught. The meeting had an emotional start, Gibbs said, Gibbs said, and for a time, no one could be heard because of shouting. There were men in the pool hall who wanted to pound Lester's attackers. There were men who wanted to harm whites for all the crimes they went on, that went unpunished. Others urged restraint out of fear of retaliation. Any action might cause businesses to suffer, and there were families and children to consider. It wasn't just crime that was discussed. The overall sense that they were not wanted brought bitterness and a desire to strike back, to throw a rock through every window that said no Negroes allowed, and to object sternly to every racial slur. In the end, the men settled on a rational approach to the main problem. They decided to petition the legislature to have the testimony law changed so blacks could testify against whites. Gibbs was appointed to write the petition. It was a time-honored American tradition to petition the government for a redress of grievances. The American colonies petitioned Great Britain because of taxation without representation. And the right of citizens to petition the government was guaranteed in 1791 by the First Amendment of the United States Constitution. Although denied the rights of citizenship because of their race, the African Americans in the pool hall decided to act like to act like citizens and ask for one fundamental right of citizens so they might lead safer lives. Gibbs wrote the petition while working in the boot emporium and after several drafts, he laid it down to a few sentences that didn't show his anger or mention Lester in a pool of blood, polite but not timid. He wrote, to the Honorable Legislature of the State of California, we beg to protest against an act concerning crimes and punishments passed April 16, 1850, by which black and mulatto persons are rendered incompetent as witnesses to give evidence against white persons. This provision denies to all colored persons protection of the law and allows the vicious and unprincipled to prey upon black people with impunity. In the name of humanity, we pray that you repeal the provision and grant to colored people the right of protection under the law. Bravo, Gibbs, bravo. That was my subjective opinion. The petition was placed on the counter of the Boot Emporium for signatures and later moved to Hall's Billiard Parlor and other businesses. Just in case anyone missed it, clergymen in the city's three black churches reminded parishioners to sign if they hadn't yet, and Gibbs took the document to some individuals who were reluctant to sign. They had either feared losing their jobs or saw the petition as a waste of time. After three months, the petition had been signed by nearly 500 people, quite possibly the entire African-American population of San Francisco. 
In its final form, signed only by African Americans, the petition, the petition declared that they could stand up for their own rights as human beings. A white friend of William Hall carried the petition to the state capital, Sacramento, where it was presented to the legislature in March 1852. It was met with wisecracks and racial slurs and then rejected by a vote of 47 to 1. The one dissenter wanted to debate the petition even though he opposed changing the laws. The other 47 didn't think the idea was even worth debating. If anything, the petition struck them as humorous. Can you imagine not having any right after that and people think it's funny? Following the rejection, Gibbs was assigned to write... I just couldn't imagine the anger. I couldn't imagine. Gibbs was assigned to write another petition. It wasn't much different from the first one. About the same number signed, and in October 1852, it, it too was rejected. 600 people signed a third petition, including 200 whites who were friends of African Americans. When it arrived at the legislature in March 1853, the lawmakers voted that it be thrown out of the, out the window. Whether they continued the fund by actually doing so isn't known. Meanwhile, crimes against African Americans continued. A barber in San Francisco was robbed at gunpoint. A laundryman in Marysville was assaulted and his equipment smashed. A dishwasher in Stockton was murdered for $200 and a horse. The people who committed the crimes weren't punished because all witnesses were black. The failure to change the law made Gibbs dispirited. He had hoped that if African Americans remained respectful and showed enough resolve, they might be granted the right of testimony. If they act, asked positively or polite, if they asked politely, they might be seen as human beings deserving to live without fear. Were the hearts of white people so hardened that they could never change? In some ways, yeah. In some ways, they have not changed. Period. In some ways, they haven't. They have not changed. It, is, it doesn't matter what their focus is. The focus is still the same. To try and oppress in order for those white men to stay in power. To keep the power. And right now, if they turn all of this chaos into blaming a woman, wouldn't white men be able to keep their, their place in society? Gear up, ladies. That's exactly what they're doing. That's exactly what they're doing. On that Saturday that all of you women didn't work, basically boycotting work because the guys didn't get their job done there at Main Street. Did they get their job done, ladies? Do you see the bus over your head, Carrie? <laughs> Whew. If that's true... You are just in for a brick wall. And Jimmy, is that Kathy? Is that the reason for the divorce? Kathy? All that DNA, all mixed up. Kathy, Jimmy. Jimmy, you look just like Kathy. Just like Kathy. How crazy, too, right? Naming yourself Jim. Oh, my gosh. <gasps> Poor Jimmy. Yeah, there's no way that you're going to get him to keep his mouth quiet. I don't think. I don't know. Who knows? Maybe. But there it is. So everybody knows. Jimmy and Kathy. Kathy's over here. Oh, the tangled web that we that is woven in all of this, right? I mean, people know it can't be hidden. It cannot be hidden. It's just whether or not people care to do anything about it. The emperor, DJT, thinks he's still leading things. Mm. The failure to change the law made Gibbs... Dis I already read that. So far, the answer was... So, were the hearts of white people so hardened that they could never change? So far, the answer was yes, and something worse. Although they made mockery of the petitions, 
the lawmakers weren't amused by the Underground Railroad, which was increasing the free black population by perhaps 10 people a month. Consequently, in 1852, they enacted the most stringent fugitive slave law of any free state. For helping a slave escape California, there was now a fine and a jail term. Come on, Lucy. Lucy, come here, honey. Good girl. Good girl. Come here by mama. She's such a good girl. I understand why you would want her, but they're not going to give you to her. Not one chance. Not because of me. Don't kid yourself. My days are numbered. So is that dog's day. So are those dogs day. That do dog's day is numbered. Whatever. Dog day afternoon. I don't even know. So 10 people a month. Consequently, in 1852, they enacted the most stringent fugitive slave law of any free state. For helping a slave escape in California, there was now a fine and jail term. And there was under the national law covering fugitives fleeing to, as there was. All right, hold on just a minute. Consequently, in 1852, they enacted the most stringent fugitive slave law of any free state. California is. For helping a slave escape in California, there was now a fine and jail term, and there was under the national law, as there was under the national law, covering fugitives fleeing to California. What made California's law unique was that it was re retroactive to 1848. This meant that any ex-slave who had arrived in California since the start of the gold rush might be returned to slavery. You SOBs, you. Wow. Wow. Chew on that for a minute. But the most frightening aspect to the law was that any African American in California could be made a slave. For example, by 1852, George, George Washington Dennis, Dennis, the floor sweeper for the El Dorado Hotel, owned a, li a livery stable. I think that's how you pronounce it. I've never been quite sure. Worth $8,000. Suppose Dennis's father claimed that his son was a fugitive and used some bogus document as proof. Suppose the man who beat Lester claimed that Lester was a fugitive. Because of the testimony law, Dennis and Lester couldn't prove otherwise. Oh my gosh. It is, it is not simply, I mean, it is just endemic. It is just so into the system that you can't even get a hold on it. But I do believe that things are different. I could be disparaged. No, that's not. Well, I guess it is the right word. Is that the right word? Kind of. It's not. Disappointed is the better word. Defeated is the best word. I could feel defeated. That is the best word, not disparaged. Uh, I could feel defeated. Um... I don't know. What is that spirit? I know because Gibbs was getting dispirited. So it is, I, we do know what the enemy is doing and the enemy is trying to kill our spirits. No matter who the enemy is, it's always the same story. They're always trying to kill our spirits. I have got to get socks on. I'm cold. I had them on, but then we went outside in early bird classroom and I got them a little damp. And so I don't want to put them back on. Oh, maybe I will since they're right here. Hold on. Give me a sec. Oh, yeah. They're fine. Oh, good. Okay. Thanks for that little pause. I just love these. These are yoga socks. I love them. We got them from the girls... Uh, we got we get together since four since we turned forty. Uh, the high school girls all get together, and uh, so we share gifts and things like that. And so these were yoga socks that we got. I just love these, but I can't find them anymore. Hold on, there they are. <laughs> you know what I mean? They've got the little crisscross there. I, I they were given to us by Shannon, and uh, I love them. And I couldn't find them though. It was they were hard to find. 
the cute ones. There were ugly ones out there that were thin and crappy. Um, but not these cute ones, for sure. But then... I know. I'm trying to get some of these things on video. I don't know why. I know it's all going to work out in the end. So I don't need to get some of these claims on video. But in case I did need to get the claim on video, uh, for all of you who believe that false claim about me, I cannot even believe that you did not come to me and talk to me about it. You didn't even ask me about it when we have been very good friends for forever. Anyway, I know all of these things that we really, I mean, it's just dealing with, it. you know, when I was reading this, I was just, we all sort of compare our experiences. And I really do think that the majority of people actually don't have exact, obviously, I've never seen a friend get beat to that extent. But I do think that we all do have a lot of pressures where we are getting pushed around one way or the other and uh, in hopes that we have, in the end, made the right choice to get our hopes, dreams, and desires. And there's only one way to do that. There, uh, We've always been told, so if you dismiss morality, you know, good luck marching through those pearly gates. And, and it's not even just, you know, it's not even that. You're just like, you know, because there's so many people that could just give me the big middle finger about, well, I'm not worried about marching to or fro on those pearly gates no but you you should be seeing the outcomes of people who do decide to do the right thing and they are the legends the meek shall inherit the earth they are our legends the people who did nothing who were complacent who were passive or those people who are causing harm, those people are not what legends are made of. It's Mifflin Gibbs. Those are the things that legends are made of. What are our storybooks that we have, right? What are legends made of? What are legends made of? Maybe that's what I'll talk about too. We have a lot to discuss. It's just sometimes hard to put everything together. Trying to keep up the pace is what I what I want to do. So what are legends made of? Let's see what they're made of. Seems to me, I don't know. I don't know. I'm going to have to think about that for a minute. Because I was talking about resources too, right? So is this fight that they are having, this has always been the question. For psychologists, I've studied it, right? And it is the question for this book and for the Underground Railroad and for the Civil Rights Movement and for the Civil War and for Reconstruction after the Civil War and the Sign of the Times. Are we, zeitgeist, Sign of the Times, <clears throat> Do we fight for resources? Is that why we're fighting? Do we really fight for resources? Or is there something more insidious going on? When the men did that and they didn't take any money and they didn't did it and they didn't want any money, that's insidious then, right? It's insidious. Anything else? You now at least we can comprehend money. Not taking money that's not yours, but we comprehend the desire. Not $200, you know, but if you were getting out of a gambling debt, at least we can comprehend. But to do this for the fun of it, that's what I was thinking about Chris, Stapleson, Chris Stapleton's song. Um, what is it? What's the song where he's, he's basically singing about the individual's that have um, been doing the school shootings or shooting up a synagogue. That song, right? You're gonna, you're gonna get yours. It's coming, whatever to you. Whatever song that was, right? That is. That's exactly what he's thinking about. Singing about how you do that. You have absolutely no moral fiber whatsoever to be able to do that. Zero moral fiber. And if you're planning anything like that against any one individual for those racist, um, fascist, 
right-wing ideas, if you're planning anything, even if it's against one person, not a large group of people, it's the same, it's, it's the same thing. You have no moral fiber. And if you allowed somebody to kill turkeys by basically taking them and slamming them up against a wall, you might create a, a, somebody who has no moral fiber. And again, how you would ever put your son in that kind of circumstance repeatedly, knowing the trauma that it caused him, repeatedly put your son in that circumstance. That not only is abuse, what that demonstrates is, is a real psychosis that's going on in the mother who would do that to a son. Margaret Farovich. You're psychotic that you did that to your son, that you hate men that much, that you hate men that much, that you would create a killer out of your son. Now, I don't know whether he's the one looks more like Ethan is, right? Or Ethan's friend. I don't know. I have no idea. But there are killers around. There are. And there are a lot of people who know it. And there are a lot of people who are excusing it. I'm just letting you know. Uh, you know what? I already know how it's going to end. I'm hoping you are sweating. That person at Fifth Third, that lady at Fifth Third, who I think is Lori Fuller, I hope you're sweating. I hope you're sweating because you made the wrong bet. Let's see here. Did I read that? Were the hearts of the white people so hardened that they could never change? So far, the answer was yes, and something worse. Although they made mockery of the petitions, the lawmakers weren't, oh, we already said it, weren't amused by the Underground Railroad, so they changed the law. But the most frightening aspect of the law <clears throat> was that any African American in California could be made a slave. For example, by 1852, George Washington Dennis the floor sweeper for the El Dorado Hotel, owned a livery stable worth $800. Suppose they were, so they could turn them back into slaves. Sure, the law worked that way. Sure, the, sure enough, the law worked that way the first time it was tested in court. Sandy Jones had been a slave all his life. Having mined gold for two years, he was set free by his owner in California. At the age of 64, his life nearly over, Jones went to work for himself, and after six months, he had $3,000, the money he needed to buy his wife and children out of slavery. It was then that Jones' owner claimed he was a fugitive. Because Jones wasn't allowed to testify and present evidence of his freedom, his return to slavery, and his owner was $3,000 richer. As a, as a professor in healthy mind, body, spirit, right, uh, knowledgeable, trained in this area of healthy mind, body, and spirit. There is no way in my mind, and I have looked for this all my life. <clears throat> it's why I went into the field in the first place, because I've always known that the health outcomes of somebody who does that have got to be so poor. Now, we've demonstrated that in uh, in all kinds of ways, in health psychology and in positive psychology, we have demonstrated that, that you cannot be a person who takes the freedom of another man away before he's about to die with no right to do that, to take that away, to take away his $3,000, to then also then prevent his wife and his child from, from freedom as well, and that you can sleep at night and you can function and you don't have acid in your gut and you don't end up getting cancerous moles all over your face and body. We know that there are repercussions and we've seen them demonstrated time and time again. Atheists at the university level would like to demonstrate to you that there is no uh, association at all. And then they'll say, well, yeah, that there's association, but association is not correlation. 
That's what I was going to talk about in philosophy class. Association is not correlation. So now I've got three type, three topics to talk about. Is, it, is not causation. Association is not causation. No, it's not, but it's pretty doggone good. And you can't get causation for the most part anyway. So correlation can be pretty darn good. It's a correlation between all of these newspaper clippings and the white race getting more money, getting richer. And it's a pretty darn good correlation, right? It's only a correlation. Nobody did the actual manipulation, which is what you have to do for causation. You have to manipulate. Are you going to be getting into the middle of San Francisco and be experimentally manipulating individuals? No, you cannot be. You can't be. And so what would you do? What would you have to do? You'd have to rely on a significant number of correlations. And by the way, you can get them. For some of the most obvious things, like these are injustices. These are injustices. This is Dr. Annette Ferovich. I'm the teacher, and this has been the Bookless Classroom. You get, as I said, a couple, a few subjective opinions brought in there, but hopefully that will inspire you to do a few more deep dives, right? I hope that that is close to where we need to be because I haven't been watching. So, um... Yeah, so giving you some information so that you so that you can do a few more deep dives. All right? I hope that interests you. And this is Dr. Not Fairwich, and I'm the teacher. This is the classroom. Thanks.